Hi, I'm Tim May, and I'm moderating this series of 10 conversations on expressive photography with Phil Douglas. Phil understands the nature of expressive photography as well as anyone I know. For 35 years, he directed the Douglas Visual Workshops, and he helped more than 10,000 communications professionals make and use photographs to express ideas, tell stories, and convey meaning. Phil says he's learned a great deal from these, those workshop participants over the years, and he en also enjoys learning from the tens of thousands of images he's made in more than 60 countries. I first met Phil uh, at Santa Fe Workshops in 2004, and we went on to photograph together across North America, as well as in Europe, Asia, Africa, and South America. Both Phil and I have displayed our images on various photographic websites, and Phil has put together a 5,000 image cyber book on expressive photography at pbase.com. You can find the link to that cyber book in the notes below. It has drawn more than 10 million visitors since he started in 2003. They have left more than 12,000 comments under his pictures, and Phil has answered each one of them. When the pandemic brought Zoom into our lives, I asked Phil to bring that cyber book to life in this set of 10 conversations on expressive photography. And now he has. Enjoy. Okay, today, making time count. Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> time is one of the three main areas where we can affect the meaning of our photographs. We talked in this series about space, choices in space. We broke it down to choices in detail, what details we include in our pictures, what details we exclude in our pictures. We talked about vantage point, where you are with your camera determines what you say. We talked about frame, vantage point determines the frame. The frame is an editor. Those are choices in space, but we, we, we we also have choices in, in time and in light, okay? So today we're talking about time. We control time by when we decide to push the shutter button. And of course, we further control time by the number we enter in our camera uh, how long that shutter stays open, down to a millisecond. And, and then we have to determine at what point, at what point do we push that button? These are all decisions that we're making, while we're also making our decisions in space and in light. So let's look at a dozen images, how I use time. There we go. A flock of seagulls in Eswaria, Morocco. Okay. I was shooting birds. They were all over the place. And I wanted to, to get a relationship, a flock of birds, so that they hang together as a family or as a covey or as a, a gaggle, whatever you call a group of seagulls. And I shot probably 20 or 30 uh, pictures because you have to make a lot of images when you're dealing with time to get the one you want. And that takes a lot of editing too, a lot of time to edit. But in this particular picture, as you see, I was looking at the spaces between these birds as they flew and I could tell when the birds were close together, when they were far apart, when they were too close or too far. What do I mean by too close? If this wing 
attaches itself to this wing in my image. You know, in reality, it wouldn't attach itself to this wing because this bird is well behind this bird. But in my picture, if he was seen to be attached to this wing, he, she, whatever, attached to this wing, it would look stupid and the picture would be ruined. So in this particular image, look at, look at the space here. I and saw that and there, there, yes. There, there, and the space here, the space here. The only touching is this, this particular one on the bottom and he's landing, so it's okay. It's okay. Oh, yeah. The yeah. other one too on the right left is touching the neck. Yes, yeah. yeah. But, but, you know, but these two are fine. Right. Because they're landing, they're coming down and they're coming into the, the group that are, are paying any attention to the commotion up above. But this is a beautiful example of how you decide when to push that button. And also I picked a very fast shutter speed that would stop motion. Now what is shutter speed? Well, it, 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 uh, it's the amount of time that you allow light to hit the sensor, which is a, a sensitive electronic device that records. And so you determine how long that shutter stays open. And then you have to balance that with your aperture to determine how much light enters the camera so you don't overexpose or underexpose your picture. And of course, a lot of this can be done for you by your built-in light meters and by motor drives or continuous shooting where you hold down the button and it goes bang, 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 and you have 15 or 20 pictures within a second. I made this picture in um, a place called Arco Sante, Arizona. And this was a, uh, a, a wonderful uh, uh, um, idea of a place, uh, a, a, a very, uh, very well-known architect, and his name eludes me at this moment. Uh, I, I apologize for that developed a, a community of the future and he, he was he, he built these uh, these structures or he, he designed them and he built some of them but it never really took off and he, he passed away but it's still a tourist attraction and this guy's playing basketball in the the space known as the gathering place and it, there were bleachers that you can see the bleachers behind uh, where people would sit and watch these events. And there's a, there is a poster on the left-hand side that is reflecting what is to the right, and it's out of focus, and, but it's a really beautiful color, greens and golds and blues, and I included that as a background to counteract the grimness of those bleachers. But the beautiful moment here is that ball sitting on the edge of that net. Is it gonna go in or is it gonna fall off? It's not gonna sit there. It's not gonna sit there. It's probably gonna fall in. And looks his like arms are up. Well, what, Tim? It looks like it. It's gonna go in. You know, his fingers are falling away. It's like a ballet dancer moving through space. Right. The ball hangs there. <coughs> now, this is the same kind of picture about a ball, but this is a group of people on Mission Beach, California, playing volleyball. And this is an interaction of people. You have a guy spiking the ball and a guy rising up to block it. And the ball hangs over that net. And you have one man standing in the back and there are a couple of kids in the water in the background. The sun is setting, so you have that wonderful glow on the water. And I made it black and white because I wanted to really emphasize the starkness of those silhouetted bodies. And if I had the golden sky and the golden sand and the blue waters, they would all be competing with the starkness. See, it's my choice. It's not right or wrong. It's not good or bad. It's what I want to say. And we have that power. 
But the beautiful part of this picture is the body language and the movement and the spacing. Once again, as in the bird picture, we have negative space here. And you can see the ball has not touched that net. His hand is striking the ball. And for me, it's the second time. So in the bird picture and this picture, the flow of the, of the uh, graphic design, it's very graphic in, in making the arch uh, with the highlight of the ball. But then on top of that, um, uh, the sand, that's another m moment in time that's involved is this sand down here in the bottom left-hand corner. Right here. That echoes the legs. It's just astounding. A plume of sand. And yes. He leaped, he pushed sand back. Right. Well, you have his flying sand in, in the lower left-hand corner here. Right. And then you have these fellows anchored in the sand. Right. They are almost buried or are buried in the sand. And what we also have here, and I, I, I just will allude to it because I'll cover this when I reach my composition module, but this, this image is triangular in shape. And right. The triangle gives you a solid base and a point of action. And that makes this picture hang together. You bet. This is a moment in time as well. This is an emotional moment. We were in Bolivia and I went out with my, with my guide. Uh, remember Tim, we had these so-called Spanish teachers that would take us out into the city. And she took me to this place where workers were boarding a truck to be taken to a community where they would work and then they would bring them home. And the expression on this person's face, the hand, there's, there's worry, there's concern, there's anxiety. These are emotional responses. And that's a matter of time when you catch them, you either catch them or not. It, it could be a flicker of emotion passing through the muscles of a face or the position of fingers. These are all moments in time. And you have to really read the action before it happens. I was photographing this woman or this, this man, I, I'm not quite sure of the gender here, but for about five minutes, because he or she was, was hanging on that edge, she wouldn't go, go sit down. She's probably waiting for someone in her family to join her who never came. But there's this, there's this intensity here that I captured. Tim, you want to add anything to emotional moments in time? No, that's, but that's one of the joys of our digital is that we can take multiple shots and, and pick the one that does it best. That's and a that powerful is, image. Thank you. I was in the Moscow subway and this is an example of the people aren't doing anything. The people are standing waiting for a train as in X marks the spot here. And I set the shutter speed on a very slow shutter speed, maybe a 15th of a second, because I wanted to make the train when it came in blurred. And sure enough, the train is screeching to a stop. The train becomes almost transparent. You see the mural on the wall behind here through the train. This was in color, but the red dress really called attention to her. And I wanted to call attention to the train. The X on her back was enough attention for her. I didn't need it in color. But again, this is interaction of subject and another subject coming together at a certain moment in time. One is static and stable, the other is blurred. It's just really, really moving fast. Here, on the other hand, this, this monk in uh, Burma, I was in this monastery and he was bathing and he had a pail 
and he had some water down in the trough and he's throwing water on himself. And you will see how he bathes. The water is enveloping him. It's flowing all over his body. It's caught, and this is an extremely fast shutter speed. <laughs> Maybe one four thousandth of, of, of a second. It's, it's faster than you can blink your eye. Mm -hmm. You can see something that you can't see with your own eyes. And that is an advantage of the time factor in photography. You can, you can show a world that is invisible to the eye by using extremely fast shutter speeds on extremely fast action, water flying through space. And you stop it and refine it. And it hangs there for an eternity. And once again, he, he was wearing red trunks and that the red was calling attention to his wet trunks. So I made it black and white. It's much stronger to say what I want to say. Mm -hmm. I was in Lhasa, Tibet, the city they call on top of the, along with La Paz, Bolivia, where we were. Uh, Lhasa, Tibet is almost as high. And the Patala here is where the Dalai Lama used to live. And of course, the communist government of China has occupied Tibet. It's now a province of China. And since their, their role is to give, give work to as many of the billions of people in China as possible, they have sweepers who come across this plaza, this mostly empty plaza. They, they bulldoze hundreds of shops and ancient, ancient shrines they being the Chinese government, to make this plaza so that, you could get, so that you could get a good view of the Patala. But they have to keep it clean. So these guys with these old straw brooms come out and they sweep with a, with a dustpan. <laughs> They're cleaning every single paving stone of this vast plaza. And I wait till these guys get close. So again, you wait and wait and wait, and they're coming and coming. And when he, push, when he pushes that down in the corner and leans forward, I get the shot. It's, it's this guy that is my, my focus. And you can't even see his face. Of course, they're wearing masks. Well, today, everybody wears a mask. But these guys, or women, I don't know what, what they are, uh, had their whole faces covered because they're always working in dust, fine dust. And I stopped the action. And once again, I made this black and white because across this whole wall, there's a huge red banner with some communist exhortation. And in color, that competed with the fineness of the action here that I was stopping. Tim, you want to add anything to this? No, I'm, I'm noticing form. Just, uh, I'm less than time. I'm my head's in form. I'm getting, trying to get into time. And you see, we have all of these things running through our heads simultaneously. Right. We're photographing. Form is a part of composition. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at how the image is put together, how the forms relate. Right. Shapes. And that, that will come in my module on composition, which is really, I, I have placed it as the final module in this conversation because that's where it wraps up everything. Whoa. I made this shot in Bolivia, a mother giving her child high fives. And she hoisted this kid in the air. You can't see the kid's face. The kid is imitating the mother. The mother is leaning back and going to slap that little hand. And I caught that, that space between the hands and the mother's expression. So you have an emotional response. You have hand action simultaneously expressing a point of a motherly companionship, motherly enthusiasm, motherly comfort, all these things that this mother is presumably giving the child. Jim, you want to add, add anything to this one? Um, I, I like the negative space, the way that you've caught the, the two hands a lot. And that's a moment in time, I agree. That's right. So. 
if you're shooting, you have to decide at what point do you press the shutter? When she brings her hand back, when it's equal to her face, when it's forward of her face, you don't know. So you better be right on the money or you're gonna miss it unless you have set your camera already on continuous shooting. And then you'll have 50 pictures to deal with. We'll figure, yeah. to figure out which one captures the moment. But you're not clairvoyant. You never know what's coming. I saw this mother. She was across the street. I used a long lens. The background is out of focus. I made it black and white later because once again, she was a, a Bolivian and Bolivia's, Bolivians wear vivid colors. And again, the coloration was so vivid that it was competing with the hand gesture and the facial responses. So again, I made this black and white. <coughs> it's not that you have to make all pictures that you're dealing with time in black and white. I'll show you some in color, I guarantee you. There we go. I've stopped Niagara Falls. This is at the base of Niagara Falls. And Move your cursor. All the debris. Right. Tumbling down gathers at the base of the fall. Old sticks and, and the boulders and a huge log. And you can see some, uh, some lichen or green growth there. But the, 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 the water is furiously boiling at this point, not in heat, but in action. And I stopped the action. Stop the action. From this point, I was about 15 feet away standing on a boardwalk at the base of Niagara Falls. And this to me was far more revealing than shooting Niagara Falls itself, which was spectacular to the eye to be there. But for a photograph, and of course, in color, you get to dif find differentiation between what is water, what is not water, mm -hmm. what, is, uh, what is plant material, what is not. Tim, you want to add anything to this one? No, it would be hard to know that, it, I mean, Niagara Falls is got to be in the, in the title or the whatever. Oh, absolutely. But, but there is a sense of, of um, a little Niagara Falls back up there in the middle top with the, the way the, the way, no, down lower, the white part. Yeah. yeah, I like that contrast in color. Thank you. Yep. This one I made in Maine. Uh, I think it's Oregon coast. Oregon, that's right, Oregon, you're right. I was on the, the, the the wrong coast. It was uh, Bannock Beach, is it? Bandon, Bandon Beach. Bandon. Bandon Beach, yeah, it's Bandon Beach. And everybody was there with their tripods. And I never carry a tripod. And the reason most photographers carry tripod is for st absolute stability when taking pictures at slower shutter speeds. And if you want moving water to suggest movement, you need a very slow shutter speed. So a handhold photograph is impossible. So what I did, I improvised and put my camera down on a low wall. It gave me the same effect as a tripod would do and use my self timer to release the shutter. And I picked a very slow shutter speed of maybe a second or two, I'm not sure. I took a number of shots at different shutter speeds because I wanted, this was at dusk. There wasn't a lot of light, but I wanted to suggest that the water is moving. And it was, not in great crashing waves, but in kind of a shimmer, a glow. Tim, you want to add to this? Um, the, the, uh, it's got a very calming feel because of the fact that it's not big, waves it's washing away and it's like the roll of erosion i love it so let's go back to this this is very fast shutter speed stopping niagara falls and this is very slow shutter speed making the water seem as if all is kind of flowing i was shooting this uh, surfer in mission beach california 
And this is the interaction of man and nature. And I caught the moment when the water is at its most, or, or the wave is at its peak here. It's just absolutely cresting. And he's riding it. And he's caught here in a moment of, of balance imbalance. Does he fall? Does he rise? Does he go up? Does he go down? His arms are out. His foot is forward. Wow. The, notice that the, the surfboard is tilted up in the direction. He's moving in this direction. And he's leaning back, holding his arms at opposite angles looking in this direction while behind me, while behind him, the furious run of water continues, flows. This picture is organized diagonally. We'll talk about that when I come to composition, how, how diagonals are very important in expressive meaning, which makes the waves move faster because of the thrust from corner to corner. Tim, you want to add anything to this one? What I'm, what I'm note, noting is, uh, now this is the third one yeah. in this series, where the fact of time causes tension in the idea of what's going to happen next. That's is the right. ball going to go down into the net? Is the ball going to get spiked? Is he going to ride the wave to the end and uh, kick out? Or is he going to fall? into the back into the wave. Right. It's all that moment of tension. And one of the most important factors in photography is, in expressive photography, is to activate the imagination of the viewer. And when you suggest through time a question, will this happen? Will this happen? For the viewer to consider intellectually, emotionally, intuitively, using their imagination. It's the same thing that abstraction does. I talked about abstraction in another module where you take out so much from a picture to leave room for the imagination to enter. Here, you're stimulating the imagination to wonder. This is perhaps the most memorable photograph that I've ever made. It's the cover of my book, Images and Ideas. It is an image that I refer to very often in my teaching. I made it in Marrakesh, Morocco. I was walking through the old souk, the ancient souk, probably two or 3,000 years old. Some of the walls are original. And I heard, I heard the sound of children playing. And I couldn't see them, but I heard them. And so I, I was walking down this narrow street. It was kind of a, a side street. A souk is a busy place. It's filled with shops and, and restaurants and hundreds of people. But this was off in a, a kind of deserted area. And it was a playground for children, in essence. But I couldn't see them. But I saw this arch and I was attracted by the play of light and color. And we'll talk about light and color in still another module. The glow of the red, it was beautiful, just beautiful. And the kids' voices got louder and louder. And suddenly I heard footsteps coming fast and I picked up my camera. I quickly set my shutter speed to a fast shutter speed, exposed on that wall, waited, and this kid launched himself into the air as he came just behind this arch here. See, there's a street running along that way. And he flew through the air, and I didn't, I didn't, I didn't catch him in the air. I caught him as he landed, flying forward. And the old textures of the old walls surround this young child. Textures in here. The diagonal of this shaft of light echoes the lean of his body. And that, again, is a compositional factor called rhythm that I'll talk about. So you know, we have so many factors here. But above all, this image is what I call 
the decisive moment. That, fra that, that phrase is not mine. It really was coined by a great photographer of the 20th century, named Henri Cartier-Bresson. He was called the master of the decisive moment because that was his motif. He would catch people and things in juxtaposition in relationships that would tell stories, stimulate imaginations, create emotional responses. And that's what I'm trying to do here. Tim? Uh, two th couple things. Did you take several shots or just this one? Just this one. Luck, so luck, 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 Philip. And lots I of luck. It's nice to have lots of luck, but someone once said, I don't I think it was Mies van der Rohe said, luck is the residue of design. If you're ready for something, if you're planning on something, and I was tipped off, I could hear these kids, I could hear the footsteps. Right. And then I love that his head is just at the edge of the color. Yes, right here, right on that line. Right. Right on that line. So that's what I mean by luck, Phil. I understand that we're talking about, I understand that we're talking about being ready and so forth, but there's good a lot. Thing, good things happen to those who wait and patience and persistence and passion are all part of photography. Right. And, and you, over a life in photography, you, you may get two or three pictures like this. Right. And I cherish them. And you may have a lot of near misses and you may have a lot of goofs where you, you try something, it doesn't work. And as Cartier Bresson himself once said, all right, move on to another picture then. Don't worry about it. Right. Just on, on, on. And that concludes my presentation on time. Wow, cool. So basically time has two elements. Uh, the, the actual time of the actual pushing the shutter and the, the amount of exposure or the time on the shutter. Basically, those are the two variables in time. Right. But there are many other variables, as I described in these 12 images. Right. Yes. But those are the two basics. Well, thank you. It's, it's fun to, I'm, I'm looking very forward to the composition. And I don't know whether it's because my mind is in the composition world lately, but we'll get there. Thank you.